Now, here's a video I've made before, but I'm remaking it for this new rebooted version of the channel. We're doing things a bit differently now. We're going to stick more to the science and the humor, and we're going to be a bit less vitriolic about it. Whatever, uh, you'll still get the point. If you still enjoy the old style videos, you can still take an odyssey of discovery, and you'll find it somewhere. Maybe. Uh, in the meantime, let's remake this video. We're dealing with uh, with Lane Norton today. Lane, who who claims to hold a uh, an advanced research degree based in nutrition. Maybe he does. Maybe he doesn't. Um, but what Lane also claims is all sorts of crazy stuff here about calories in, calories out. So let's have a look at it and uh, and laugh our way through it uh, as is appropriate to what he's saying. Radio, good. Off we go. What's up guys, it's Friday, and so you know what that means. It is time for WTF. What the fitness? Absolutely hilarious, Lane. What the f And this week we go back to fitness TikTok, the gift that keeps on giving. Wait, is this TikTok? Oh no, sorry, this is Instagram Reels. I can't tell the difference because they're the same thing. I still, I'm not up on the, the Reels thing. This is from an account called your.keto.pharmacist. Mm -hmm. All right, you know, I hate to be that person to point out the glaringly obvious. You're uh, actually, Lane, it's me that's pointing out the glaringly obvious today. Uh, it's it's not you, actually. It's, well, we'll get to it. Pharmacist, and you don't know how to spell lose. It's lose, not loose. Loose is what you do to your belt when you have to go up a size because you've eaten more calories than you've expended. Uh calories, Lane, are heat. It's explicitly defined as heat, explicitly measured as heat. Uh, that's what they are. You can't eat heat at all. There's no way to eat heat. You can only eat food in its physical manifestation, the thing that we perceive to be matter, um, carbohydrates, fatty acids, amino acids, alcohol, all things that contain an amount of effective energy, depending on how much of those things you eat and in what proportion and all sorts of interactions with all sorts of systems in your vastly complicated human system, your, um, your enteric system function, your hormonal system function, your endocrine system function, your effective energy expenditure, all sorts of things come into play there. Um, but certainly you, can, you cannot eat calories because they are heat. Okay, what's next? Basically, she says that calories in, calories out is bro science, and the human body is way more complicated than that. It, and that's correct. It's actually not. Yeah, it really is, Lane. It really is. I mean, it's it's amazing that you would stand there and make claims about what's really simple and what's really straightforward, and then you turn around and say stuff like you're about to say soon, and I'm already laughing because I've seen this before, and it's so amusing. Can't wait. <laughs> If you look at the tightly controlled metabolic ward studies. Great, cite one. Anyone at all. Tightly controlled metabolic ward studies that follow human beings who are genetically identical without any confounding cofactors at play whatsoever, kept under lock and key and, and adequate observation of a disciplined styly for a significant period of time so that we can make any kind of assertion about this. Lane, point to one. Cite any one well-controlled study of the kind that you're talking about. We won't wait because we'll be waiting indefinitely. They don't exist. You're making things up, Lane. But that's not the most amusing thing that you make up in this video. <laughs> uh, I can't wait. Stick around. It's going to be great. When they assess people's energy expenditure. But how do you do that, Lane? How are you going to measure that? En energy expenditure. Energy is a construct. Energy is not an actual phenomena that can be measured. You can measure manifestations of what the construct of energy is, the consequences of the construct of energy. You can measure temperature of a given system or body. You can measure 
radiant output of a certain system. Um, you could measure actual physical work done, weight moved from place to place, according to work equals force times distance, perhaps. But that doesn't get to actual energy expended necessarily at all. Vastly complex system, many degrees of freedom at play. And then they precisely control their intake. But how, Lane? How are you going to precisely control someone's energy intake if you're not making all the adjustments that are necessary on the basis of different levels of thermic effect of different foods and combinations of different foods, which is individual to the person concerned. And as such, do you then have their research twin being genetically identical and also separated at birth or even before birth, locked in separate labs so that there are no confounding variables that can possibly be at play? No? Okay. Good. Hmm. What about the fact that most amino acids are not actually metabolized for energy, but rather are adopted and used in the structures of the body and as such effectively do not contain energy to speak of at all, and yet it's still listed as 4K calories, so-called per gram for, for proteins, the exact same as for carbohydrates, even though almost all carbohydrates are either oxidized in the short term or stored in another form, that being fat, and then oxidized at a later stage, perhaps, or indeed stored indefinitely in some people's cases. Controlling intakes precisely. Tell me how that's done, Lane. Uh, maybe you could do that by pointing to one of these studies that controls people adequately, which doesn't exist either. Good. Carry on. What's next? They lose or gain almost the exact amount of weight that is predicted. People say, well, we're not. Almost the exact amount predicted. You see how there's no numbers there that you've given us there, Lane, at all? Neither have you actually cited a single piece of peer-reviewed literature that would establish that claim. It's interesting, isn't it, boys and girls, that he's making these wild, grandiose claims about things without backing those claims up with the slightest hint of any actually properly designed, properly controlled, properly powered, properly tenured metabolic ward lock-in studies with genetically identical populations that are large enough for statistical power, and then shown us effects which are clear and unambiguous statistically and or possibly clinically. You just want to stand there and make ridiculous claims. Okay, good. Bomb kilometers. No, we're not. But we kind of are. Ooh, goodness, goodness me, goodness me. Perhaps, perhaps we need to keep our voice at a slightly lower pitch there, Lane. Because here's the thing. There's this thing called the first law of thermodynamics. Yes. And so what? What does that have to do with this situation besides absolutely nothing whatever? Anyway, carry on. This is the good bit. Which states that matter cannot be created or destroyed, only transferred in form. <laughs> oh, Lane Norton. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Lane has just claimed that matter is conserved. He's also claimed that the first law of thermodynamics states that matter is conserved, which Lane the first law of thermodynamics does not make any such claim that matter is conserved. And I'll tell you why it doesn't make that claim, Lane. It's because matter is not conserved. <laughs> Mr. PhD in nutrition science or something. I don't know. How do you get a PhD if you don't understand first principles of physics? Like, matter is not conserved. Um, look, I'll give you a couple of examples of, of how matter is not conserved. Let's, uh, let's take one from quite recently, I guess, in terms of scientific um, looks at things, scientific work that's being done. You can look uh, to the teams of researchers at Slack, the Stanford Linear Accelerator, that is, or indeed at the Large Hadron Collider, if you like. And what they do is they take small amounts of matter and they accelerate those matter um, up to very, very close to the speed of light and basically interact them together, whack them into each other. And generally what comes out of such collisions is, you know, many, many thousands of times the mass that went in. 
whoops, so mass is not conserved. Um, also, we've, we've known that mass is not conserved for quite some time, and it was first really shown to the world on the on the major stage so that everybody could be aware of of it and see that it's you know a real thing uh, that occurred in hiroshima japan on the 6th of august 1945 when the us of a dropped a uh, a nuclear device upon that city and um, caused the deaths of hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, I think most of those were instantaneous because mass is not conserved. <laughs> lame. Oh my word, my word. So not only have you got it wrong that the first law of thermodynamics is anything whatever to do with the energy balance of an open thermodynamic system like a human being free living in the universe, you also don't even understand what it says. You don't know what the first law of thermodynamics says because you've just said it says something that it does not say. <laughs> oh, my word. My word. Dear idea. In fact, the first law of thermodynamics is about the already established um, so-called law of conservation of energy, which is also incorrect. By the way, energy is not conserved either necessarily. It is to all intents and purposes in day-to-day -day life in the universe, sure, but it actually isn't, so that's not correct either. So invoking thermodynamics with regard to energy balance in a human being is just fundamentally ridiculous from the ground up. Um, but let's go through that and see what you've got to say on it, other than claiming it says something it does not say. Okay, good. And so, when you eat something, the carbons that are in that must go somewhere. Uh, yes, in effect, to all intents and purposes, but so what? What's that got to do with your energy balance? Energy, Lane, is not contained in carbon atoms that human beings derive energy from at all. Do you know, this is, a, this is an individual who claims to have an advanced research degree in nutritional science. And he doesn't understand that humans don't derive energy from carbon atoms or that, that mass is not conserved. Oh, dear. Yeah. They don't flitter off into oblivion. And no, correct that. Well, in a way, they really do when you actually exhale carbon dioxide at the lungs lane and those carbons that have been um, liberated from the hydrogens and oxygens attached to those carbon skeletons in the foodstuffs. Um, that those carbons are then added to some oxygen that you breathed in, and um, whoosh, out they go at the lungs. So they really do actually flit off to entropy to spread themselves evenly into the atmosphere in the relatively um, somewhat closed system of the um, of the Earth. The Earth is actually an open system, but we'll get to that another day. What's next? We can measure them. Again, Lane, perhaps keep your voice down below the threshold of pain would be would be appreciated. Thanks. And we can see where they go. And then the next thing is, well, it only applies to an isolated system. Not true. It yeah, is it is true. <laughs> Again, oh my word. The first law of thermodynamics, Lane, relies entirely on an assumption of an isolated thermodynamic system, which doesn't actually exist anywhere in reality in the universe. It's a hypothetical situation. The closest thing that actually exists is a closed thermodynamic system, which human beings are not one of. We're open. So we're the furthest thing away from an isolated system there is. And so we are the furthest example of anything that you could apply the first law of thermodynamics to. And it's very, very clear and obvious and patent to everybody watching this lane that you don't even know what the first law of thermodynamics says because you think it says mass is conserved. No. <laughs> oh, dear. Balance already assumes that the system is not closed. because No, it doesn't. It does no such thing, Lane. It explicitly assumes the system is closed. The mathematics of the first law absolutely rely upon that. My word. So what do you think thermogenesis is? It is the wasting of energy as heat, which is part of your BMR, part of... And one of the reasons why the first law of thermodynamics is not applicable to open systems like a free living human being in the universe. Oh dear. You're neat and part of other parts of your physical activity. So this idea that, oh, well, it's not accounting for these things. Yes, it is. No, it isn't, Lane. 
No, it's not. Not at all. When you're telling people that counting their calories at home is an appropriate, robust, and scientifically valid means to establish with any degree of accuracy or confidence whatsoever of any utility at all, that counting their calories in is going to work for them, and comparing that with their calories out, no son, not at all. There is absolutely no way that somebody at home without vastly expensive, prohibitively um, expensive scientific equipment of a very high level could get anywhere near actually coming up with anything like an accurate measurement of their effective energy intake or energy output at home. Can't be done, Lane. Will never be done. The only way to make CICO work as a tool for predictable fat loss, body composition change in that respect, is to vastly grossly undereat. Because of the vast inaccuracy in the measurement of both energy in and energy out when you're using the calorie as your estimate of the actual effective energy, because that is so inaccurate, you have to undereat by such a large amount to actually get a predictable result that you're doing damage to your metabolic system, your endocrine system, your hormonal system, your organ systems very, very likely. And it's not a sustainable or um, realistic lifestyle for a human being. It's also completely unnecessary. You do not need to watch your food intake or count your calories or restrict the amount of food you eat if you would just eat the right thing. The right thing that you are designed genetically and by four and a half million years at least of both positive and negative selection pressure to eat, that will set up your hormonal system, your endocrine system, your organ systems, and all your systems in such a way as that you will easily, normally, naturally have ideal body composition as genetically determined, and you will automatically moderate the amount of food you intake because you have very, very good satiety signals under the circumstances I'm talking about when you're eating an appropriate diet lane. Okay? Mr. PhD in nutrition science, who doesn't know what the first law of thermodynamics even says, or how it applies to an open system, or indeed that mass is not conserved. <laughs> oh, good, good. What else have you got for us? Yes, it is. And no. In fact, did you know one of the first ways that they kind of discovered this was essentially by putting an animal... How many jump cuts can you put into five seconds of video lane? Why do you need to jump cut every three seconds? Are you that um, brain fogged? that you can't actually just speak to a topic and get it done? What's, what's the go here? What's the problem? Well, in essentially a bomb kilometer, not, not quite, but if you want to understand what a bomb kilometer is, it's how they measure how many calories are in a foodstuff. So they no, it's not, actually. It's not at all. Put the food stuff in, in a closed container. Not an effect in the human body. If you were to use calories as a measurement of the actual effective energy available to a human being by eating that food substance. No. The amount of effective energy in a different bolus of food depends very much on a number of different things and bears very little relationship often to the amount of heat that can be released by rapidly combusting a given amount of the, that given bolus of so-called food stuff. Okay, so no, again, wrong. <laughs> they burn it, and then in the outside of that container, there is water, and there's a thermometer, and they measure how much the temperature of that water changes mm -hmm. in response to burning that food. Mm -hmm. And that can be used to figure out how much energy is in the food that was burned. And no, it can't be, Lane. That's the whole point here. No, it can't. No. The amount of energy effectively available to a human being from consuming a given bolus of a given makeup of a given so-called food substance bears often very little resemblance, whatever, to the amount of energy that can be released from that same thing by burning it. Humans don't burn food. Okay? So, no. 
son. Not at all. In a brilliant experiment, they took a rat or mouse, can't remember which one, put it inside of a closed container surrounded by ice and looked at how much the ice melted in response to that animal moving around. And guess, Sorry? guess what they found? It was almost exactly what they predicted based on the energy expenditure and energy consumed. So when you so and when you say almost exactly, again, Lane, you want to provide us with the reference. You want to provide us with the actual empirical numbers so that we can look at those and see how almost exactly it was and point to the flaws in that study. No? You just want to make ridiculous, unfounded claims. Okay, good. Say we're not like a bomb criminal? Eh, actually, we kind of are. No, we can't. We absolutely are not anything like a bomb calorimeter. A bomb calorimeter burns, combusts food rapidly inside a closed system, which allows the transmission of heat externally, but not mass. A human being oxidizes food substrates, some of them, very, very slowly relative to what a bomb calorimeter does. And we are an entirely open system thermodynamically. So we are not remotely similar in any way, Lane, at all. When you consider that the human body exists in the universe, if you consider that the universe is closed, although some people would argue that, but hey. <laughs> it's because it isn't. The world we live in, the atmosphere, is closed. Yes, it's going to be kept. No, it isn't. Lane. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, my word. My word. You can't even get that right. Neither is the world closed or the universe closed by the thermodynamic definition of what a closed system is. No. <laughs> Wrong again. <laughs> oh, my word. So this idea that calories in, calories out is too simplistic to explain. It, it's not that it's too simplistic. It's that it's just simply, completely wrong. The calorie is not a measurement of the effective energy either consumed nor spent by the human organism. That's it's the wrong currency of the concept, the construct of energy. It is false from the ground up. Its foundations are no good. You cannot build a, a tower of scientific robustitude on a fundamentally unstable foundation that foundation being a fallacious and false idea about what your first principles even are. And you clearly, Lane Norton, have not the first clue what you're talking about. The first law of thermodynamics does not apply to open thermodynamic systems by its very definition. Okay? Simple. Secondly, mass is not conserved. <laughs> Thirdly, human beings, the planet Earth, nor the universe, none of those are closed systems. <laughs> wow. In weight loss or weight gain. No, that's weight, you say. Weight can be made up in a number of different ways, Lane, and the biggest contributor to one's weight is water. So you don't even understand that. Clearly. Wow. That's bullshit. The concept of calories in and calories out is very simplistic, but the mechanisms and the way it works in terms of energy balance are- It doesn't work in terms of energy balance lane. That's the whole point here. Are very complicated when you consider that your BMR is not stagnant. It changes based on the amount of- Stagnant? You mean static? <laughs> Here's a guy that's taking a crack at someone who gets the words loose and lose mixed up, and he, and he says stagnant for your metabolic state instead of static. <laughs> oh, 
my word. My word. My word. Of calories you consume. For example, it's like gas in a car. Except if you fill your tank up, now your fuel efficiency goes way down. But as you get closer to empty, your fuel efficiency goes way up. Because as you restrict calories, your BMR decreases. You can't restrict calories, Lane. Calories are heat. Your body temperature remains steadfastly plus or minus a very small amount, 37 degrees Celsius. Calories are heat. That's the only thing they are. They are explicitly um, defined as such. They are explicitly measured as such. They are heat. Calories are the, are the sending out of photons and nothing else. Okay? This is really simple. Increases disproportionate to the amount of restriction incurred. As you increase calories, your BMR increases disproportionate to the amount of calories incurred. You mean effective energy, which is not in the form of calories, which are photons, heat. The energy we consume is in a potential form, that being the chemical form of the carbohydrates, fats, amino acids, sometimes alcohol that contains that potential energy. Heat is not potential energy, it's actual kinetic energy. It is the exuding of photons. The human being cannot capture incoming photons to any significant degree whatsoever and use that for metabolic process. You cannot consume calories. Okay? Get it together. Further, things like NEAT, your non-exercise activity thermogenesis, which is like random small movements throughout the day, like what I'm doing with my hands. I'm, now I'm- Yeah, you shouldn't do that when you're presenting, by the way, Lane. It's very, very distracting. Sit on your hands. Purposely doing this, but before I wasn't doing it purposely. It just happens. So small fidgety movements actually make up a big portion of our energy expenditure per day. And they've shown that even- Day? Who's day, Lane? 10% weight loss can reduce your NEAT by 600 calories per day. Again, that's an estimate based on a completely inappropriate currency for energy, the construct of energy being the calorie. Calories are heat. Humans lose energy to entropy in a number of different ways, only one of which is heat. You cannot and to convert between all the different other currencies of energy with any accuracy whatsoever. That's the whole point here. I would have thought this is pretty straightforward and simple, but then I also think that understanding Noether's theorem and the laws of conservation are also quite simple. Lane clearly doesn't get that because uh, he thinks mass is conserved. <laughs> Oh my word. Oh dear. People don't understand this. And so they think I was on this. People don't understand this, says Lane Norton, who makes a video like this one here and then wants to cast aspersions on other people's understanding of things. <sighs> oh, this is comedy gold, isn't it, class? This many calories, which should have been a calorie deficit, and I didn't lose weight. Maybe you weren't factoring in metabolic adaptation. You also how, how are they going to do that, Lane? People at home, because you're telling people at home that calories in, calories out is correct, robust, and scientific, and is a usable tool by people out there in the marketplace. How do they do that, Lane? And do they need to understand that mass is not conserved in order to make those calculations? Do they also need to understand that the first law of thermodynamics actually is not applicable here and has nothing whatsoever to do with this situation, whatever, at all? Can you help them with either of those problems, Lane? <laughs> <laughs> Probably were weighing yourself randomly, and if you oh, weighing yourself, okay, great. Well, what if I was to consume a diet that's calorically deficient to the tune of oh nine thousand calories over a given period of time, and as such, I would therefore be expected to lose pretty close to one kilogram of fat stored off my body because 
that's what it would be. And, you know, you, you claim to have these studies, Lane, that means that this comes out almost exactly as we'd expect, so therefore that'll be what it would be. I would lose a kilogram, okay? Except, Lane, that in the same period of time that I consume a calorically deficient diet to the tune of 9,000 calories over a period of time that we're talking about, in that same period of time, I consume so much excess water that my body is now retaining 9.5 kilograms of excess water in it because I'm also inflamed because of the you know input of my various metabolic and endocrine systems and all those kind of things, hormonal systems and all those other really complex things that come into play. And now I go and stand on a scale lane and I'm 500 grams heavier than I was. Whoops. Seriously? You want to be taken seriously as a scientist here, Lane Norton? Wow. You don't, if you weigh yourself randomly and you don't weigh every day, you can... This also, by the way, is the same character who had a crack at me very recently on the fake book about how... Um, well, I mean, it was just a, a, a vapid, vacuous, flaccid attempt at... Um, trying to break down my credibility in some way by posting a statement about me not existing in returning to a search term using not even the correct name for me on an old employer of mine that I worked at between 19 uh, sorry, 2001 and 2003, when I was just getting started out at that time in academia, really, and had very, very few peer-reviewed publications at that time and was not particularly well known in my field of expertise or anything like that. And that was supposed to be an indication that I wasn't worth listening to. And then... <laughs> I look on your channel lane and see that this video that I've already dealt with before is still here, and you're still claiming that mass is conserved. <laughs> when anybody who knows the first thing about science will tell you it's not, or indeed anyone who was in Hiroshima on the 6th of August, 1945, or indeed in Nagasaki several days later, for example, <laughs> or indeed anyone that works at Slack or the Large Hadron Collider and any of the research groups that are based there, they'll all agree with me, and they'll all tell you, Lane, that you're completely off the planet here. Uh, they'll also tell you that the first law of thermodynamics absolutely does rely on the assumption of a uh, isolated thermodynamic system, which doesn't actually exist, and they'll all tell you that it does not apply to a free-living human being, which is an open system. Irrespective of whether or not an old employer of mine, where I also did some of my undergraduate training and some of my postgraduate training as well, would return a null result when you search for me by name when you get my name wrong. <laughs> oh, oh dear. Dear, oh dear. Okay, anyway, what's next? You can think some funky shit's happening because maybe you just weighed in on a day where you had more salt the day before and now you're up two pounds and you're thinking, well, I'm eating 1500 calories and look, I gained two pounds. You had fluid retention of two pounds. If you'd weighed yourself consistently, you would see that your weight is likely dropping. Finally, she's- Or, Lane, if you actually measured accurately the component of your body that is actually fat, if that's what you're talking about, then you'd actually have some gauge on that. But if you just put somebody on a scale, that was my whole point of previously, you're not going to get any gauge on their composition. The weight is completely irrelevant, and you can't even get that right in your little video here. Incredible, isn't it? It says, I lost weight, and I didn't have to eat one calorie less. Well, maybe. But it means you had more energy expenditure. Where did that... How do you know that, Lane? Are you suggesting seriously and ex expecting us to believe for one second that the endocrine system, the hormonal system, et cetera, et cetera, 
is not at play here and does not have an effect over the balances of fat, muscle, skeletal structure to some extent, and the most important one, water. Here's an example of that. In the first two weeks of 2022, I was doing my first two weeks of a 100% carnivore diet challenge with the steak and butter gang. I was undertaking a thing called priming during that stage where you eat five and a half, six times the calories that you have been hitherto for two weeks solid, which I did. All documented. During those two weeks of me eating eight and a half, nine thousand calories, give or take, per day, every day, without fail, for 14 days in a row, guess what happened to my weight, Lane Norton? It dropped by 15 pounds. Calories in, calories out, always works though, says Lane Norton, who thinks mass is conserved. Oh yeah, okay. Now of that 15 pounds, 10 of it was water that I lost. The other five was fat. How do I know that? Because I've got a biometric impedance scale, which is quite accurate. It claims to have an accuracy of around about 95%. My muscle mass didn't change significantly. Neither did my skeletal compartment mass change particularly. So I lost 10 kilos of water and five of fat while consuming Eight and a half, nine thousand calories a day, every day for 14 days in a row lane. Do you want to explain that for us? No? Okay. I think we're just about done here. What's next, Lane? energy expenditure come from because it's not fucking wizardry it's not fucking magic and the fact that someone can get a degree in pharmacy and not says a bloke who doesn't understand that mass is not conserved or understand what the first law of thermodynamics is and what it says and what it doesn't say and where it's applicable and where it's not. Incredible, isn't it? The cognitive dissonance, the arrogance of this man-child here. No business holding an advanced research degree in any topic related to science. None at all. The most incredibly ignorant person I've come across just about in my travels around the interwebs. Unreal. Amazing. <laughs> Keep it up though, Lane. You're doing great work. I understand the first law of thermodynamics. Yeah, I do very, very well, Lane, and you don't. You think it says mass is conserved. <laughs> and you think it applies to open thermodynamic systems. <laughs> it doesn't. What's next? Is absolutely fucking mind blowing. I really What's mind blowing is that Lane Norton considers himself remotely qualified to speak on science, given the clear, obvious, and patent evidence to the contrary that we've all seen here today. Thanks, Lane, for making my job so easy. I hope she's not prescribing my pills. I'm just kidding. I don't take. I, I think you really do need to go and take some pills. Actually, that's just my opinion. It doesn't have to be anybody else's. Uh, anyway, there we go. There's there's Lane Norton and his views on on calories in, calories out, um, debunked. But, sorry, Lane. Not a single thing right there in anything you had to say. Wow, incredible. Join me next time when um, we'll do something different. <laughs> Oh dear, dear oh dear. Right, see you then.